the Lax Factor Podcast. What is up? You're watching the 123rd episode of the Lax Factor Podcast. We are in uh, blizzard mode here in upstate New York as I sit here early, early this morning. We are getting absolutely dumped on. Uh, with snow. I think we'll have 35 to 40 inches by the time we're done. So that is crazy. But beyond the blizzard we got in the Northeast here, uh, we have PLL, Premier Lacrosse League, and the Major League Lacrosse, Major MLL uh, merger to talk about. It sounds a lot more like the PLL is just eating the MLL, its brand, and you know maybe 15 to 20 players or so. It could end up being more than that. We'll talk about that. Uh, but before we get into that, the question of the day, what is your take on the PLL and the MLL merger? If you're from a now former MLL market, how bad will you miss it? And you know, do you, if you have a fondest memory, let us know in the comments below. What do you guys think? Uh, I say on YouTube, let us know in the comments. If it's Instagram or Facebook, let us know in the comments. So discuss that. What is your take on the merger? And if you're from one of those MLL towns, how sad are you uh, between yesterday and today? And before we dive into everything else, as always, be sure to like and subscribe, share the video with your homies, uh, share it like crazy, actually. And if you want to listen to the audio only version, you can get it anywhere you listen to podcasts. But the, the home is anchor.fm forward slash lax factor. And you can always go to laxfactor.com you can get yourself t-shirts hats all sorts of crap this is a lax factor hat but we have non non-brand stuff too just regular lacrosse gear as well so you can go there and help us out that way also all right so we got to talk about this crap it's pretty crazy crazy news dropped wednesday morning as we talked about with a little quick hit update uh yesterday that i put out how does it impact the players? We talked about just some of the, the dumbness, not the dumbness of it, some of the, the move, moving parts of it. And it's, uh, it's no, the, all the details aren't out yet. But, you know, what I wanted to get into today is kind of how is this going to affect the MLL players? How is it going to affect some of the, the PLL players? So guys that we know are going to make the move that the bulk of people are really excited about Lyle Thompson. He's a no brainer. If uh, it, he'll fit in with any team, just about as long as they don't have some kind of ball hawking uh, attackman on that team as well, he can play attack and draw all the eyeballs. He could play midfield if called upon and draw all the eyeballs. He's one of those guys that you put him on the field. He's drawing eyeballs. It's free and other guys up, even though he's a ball carrier uh, it will still play well, and the way he plays is nice with other players. Um, so Lyle Thompson, that's a no-brainer, and that's the one I think everyone's really, really excited about. He he brings a huge following in terms of a fan base. He brings a, hu a pretty big social media following, and he's been doing better in that in that arena. And he's just, you know, to me, he's the GOAT. He's the, the second greatest college player of all time behind Mikey Powell, and to me, one of the top five lacrosse players to ever play the game, at least in my lifetime. So Lyle Thompson, no, no brainer. Uh, Bucaro had a really good season and I would expect that he would probably be another one that's going to make that transition. He, he's, he, his persona fits and he, he had a great season last year and he's just, you know, the perfect kind of guy for, for mixing it in there. So I think Bucaro is definitely going to go. You have a lot of guys that are kind of on the bubble because the, this is a really, really deep college draft class coming out. And you have some of these breakout stars, a guy like Ryan Lee, uh, RIT kid who tore it up in the MLL, Bubba Voigt, who I figured eventually would start tearing it up at the pro level at some point. Uh, Bubba Voigt, Q's kid, he tore it up in the MLL last year as well. So those guys are just hardcore scoring freaks that could fill holes off ball, you know, for teams that need off ball help. Uh, but then you also have coming out of the, the college draft, guys like Mac O'Keefe, uh, that also fit that mold. So there's only so many of these uh, uh, kind of specialty positions where it's like, all right, hey, if you're an attackman that can carry and dodge, boom, you know, and, and if you're one of the elite, you're going to they're going to find a spot for you somewhere. If you're kind of one of these specialty position players, there's only one or two spots probably that are going to end up popping up for each of these positions. If you're an LSM in the MLL, if you're not quick as crap, that might hurt you. So we'll get into that a little bit here though. But anyway, those guys, uh, Sean Scanoni, uh, goalkeeper for who was it? The hammerheads. I think he was the goalkeeper for this season. I would think that he's a, a fan favorite and an incredible goalkeeper right up there in every stat in the MLL last year. So I think that he would make, he would be an obvious choice to make it in the PLL and, um, let us let us see here. And then 
in terms of the rules, like as we start talking about, okay, now we're trying to figure out which MLL guys we're, are, we're going to take in this expansion draft. How is that going to work? Are other teams going to have chances at sniping a couple of MLL guys here and there on top of the expansion team? Like I'm trying, and, and will they have like a protected rosters where the expansion team can, can pull from both the MLL and from the PLL? Uh, we'll, we'll get those details as time comes out here. But one of the things that's interesting to think about, and I think it was uh, Devitt and uh, Foy that talked about it in their podcast was how do the rules uh, play into personnel choices now you've got dudes who have already played two years in the PLL with the new rules the new rules would be uh, well not necessarily rules but field dimensions 10 foot shorter field in the middle so that you know speed is important there and they, they said that with the speed and they mentioned maybe even some LSMs that are bigger guys bulkier guys bruisers do they not make the cut but I would posit that the the shortened field length actually helps some of those big guys maybe. So maybe, you know, as long as those big guys have have mean sticks and could still get up the field in, in transition, you would think that that might not hurt him that bad. But the shortened field plays into it. The shot, uh, the shorter shot clock, I think, what's the PLL? 53 seconds versus 60 in the MLL. So it's one of those deals where what's that worth in terms of personnel? If you're comparing a guy in the MLL who hasn't played within these the, the new rules yet and a PLL guy who has – is it is that worth something? If these two guys are kind of equal, do you take the PLL guy because he no longer has to adjust, or do you take the MLL guy? You know, all those things are going to play, and it'll be interesting to see how they how they do factor into the decisions that are made. Will will there be less MLL guys taken in the end because of the draft? Because the player pool in the PLL is already pretty big, and because you know it, the experience factor within the PLL, how much does that limit uh, some of the changeover from guys going from the MLL? into the PLL. So, and then we have the whole part where it stinks. You know, you have, you have, it, it's great. I'm, I'm all for it. Like, I, I'm not saying that the, the merger stinks. I mean, the merger, the writing was on the wall. I didn't, I knew it was coming. I didn't know it was coming this quickly, but in hindsight with COVID doing what it did to the MLL playoffs, I, it makes total sense that they were like, Hey, we've got to, you know, get this knocked out and do this now because we don't even know we don't know the details and you know that we're going on in the back but it's possible the MLL didn't even have a season in 2021 based on how 2020 ended we don't know what their deal was i think that the consolidation of the ownership in the MLL meant that that was probably going to buy them a little time. I know Devitt and them talked about how a lot of people thought that when the uh, MLL consolidated ownership, got rid of a couple teams and, and and brought all of the partners kind of together to have this, hey, we're this smaller base of owners that own all these teams now. I think that was actually a good thing as well. They mentioned they thought that was that provided them strength in the same way that the PLL had strength. You had some deep pockets that were willing to try to grind it out for a couple more years to see if they could outlast the PLL the same way they outlasted the whatever the other little travel league that popped up for. I think Mike Powell and Johnny Christmas and those guys played in it for a little bit. So I I thought they would make it a little longer. They didn't. So the writing's on the wall. They they who knows how long they've been talking, but they get the deal done. Now you have what? Six I think there was what, six teams in the MLL? Five teams gone. Personnel, coaches, uh staff, game day staff, all of those people out of jobs right now. Some of them will be able to transition into the PLL, but it's probably not going to really happen. The PLL is a player, you know, player run organization and and then you have the people that they already have in the key roles. So, a lot of people are out of their jobs and then most people are upset about the players that are out of their jobs. But one of the angles that the barstool uh, uh the crease dive guys talked about was you could look at it as poor woe is them, poor them, blah blah blah, or you could look at it as the the only thing that changed is the requirements to play pro lacrosse got a lot tighter. And that's not a bad thing for the sport, you know, where we kind of had uh, – everybody thought that second year of the PLL, that first draft, everybody thought obviously every player that gets taken is going to the PLL where they can, where a PLL team will have them. And that ended up not being the case. We saw guys like Kraus, huge pickup for the MLL. It was a big win for them. Um, so, what you know, what is – it was really, I think the MLL, if COVID didn't happen, would have had a really good chance to, you know, continue to stay at, stay pace with the PLL. Maybe the PLL had more eyeballs on the sport, but, you know, the PLL could have gotten old. And I think the MLL was hoping that the PLL failed like some of the other leagues did. And boom, we're back in business again. And we'll just pick up the scraps and the assets after that all happens. Didn't work out that way. COVID hit. I think that put a huge monkey 
uh, wrench in their plans. Is that even a thing? Did I say that right? And that's, I think, probably what progressed this to happening now. It's like, hey, let's cut our losses. They beat us. Their their tournament went better. You know, their their first season, they did better than us in terms of eyeballs, social media, marketing in general. Everything the PLL did was superior, except the product in the field. The MLL put a, a – I think – Everybody would agree the PLL has a lot more star power and probably had more talent overall than the MLL did. But let's not forget some of the greatest players in the world still played in the MLL. A guy like Michael Kraus still chose to play in the MLL. Uh, Lyle Thompson was still there. So, uh, uh, I mean, and then he, uh, Stotts and um, uh, who else? I'm just drawing blanks here as I think, but there was no shortage. Uh, Stanwick is still running around. So there's no shortage of dudes that were running around in the MLL that were insanely talented. So I, what I kept saying was the PLL had the more exciting players and the, it was more fast paced, but it was, it was a different sport. The MLL was a little bit closer um, to traditional lacrosse than I think what the PLL was. And I think the MLL, the play seemed a little bit more polished. Maybe it wasn't polished at all. Maybe it was pace of play just seemed a little bit more consistent with what we've gotten used to seeing. Whereas the PLL, they're all over the place. I, but the PLL won. The writing on the wall, PLL one. I, I saw this coming. I'm just surprised it happened this quickly. But in hindsight, I'm not. You know, the COVID COVID has really fucked a lot of things up for people. Um, so those that, I, as I say, like for those guys that are crying in your beer, or if you're a Puritan, crying in your milk. Uh, for the players, I mean, it does suck, and I my heart goes out to those guys. It, it's terrible. But from a overall sport standpoint. It, it just got a lot harder to be a professional lacrosse player, which means the quality you're going to see on the field in the PLL is going to go up because they really are going to truly have all of the best players in the world on PLL rosters, not split between these two leagues. And that can only be good for the sport overall. And uh, and then just having it all under one umbrella and one marketing machine. I mean, the PLL proved they're going to get more. They have the better TV deals. They're going to get the sport in front of more people. So that's also huge. And now mix with that, we have the best players. Uh, they pay better. Uh, so everything so far. Now, who knows how, how sustainable that is over time. But the PLL was the obvious winner. Um, and let's see here. And then getting into the, the college draft. I mean, guys that I'm excited about. Right off the top, you got the, the two big cats, Jeff T, who's going to be the biggest NLL draft pick in a long time, and he'll be big time in the PLL. You've got Michael Sowers now, uh, who will also now be playing it presumably in the PLL. Even, even These guys are all going to have day jobs still, but they're going to be getting to rock lacrosse on a lacrosse field for the PLL. Uh, and then you end up having a, a guy like JT Giles Harris out of Duke that I'm really excited about because I feel like from a long pole standpoint with the shortened field, that dude was built to play in the PLL. So I think he's going to be huge. And then, you know, you go just through the depth is ridiculous. Um, you got a Jamie Trimboli coming out of the Qs. Uh, you've got uh, Drake Porter and it's going to end up coming out of the Qs here. You've got Mac O'Keefe coming out of Penn State. Mac o and to me, Mac O'Keefe is the, I think Mac O'Keefe, before he's done with his career, has a legitimate shot at being being the best, potentially the best off-ball player in the history of the game. You haven't seen, I've watched a ton of the, the Penn State games, but then I've specifically watched a ton of highlights and tape on Mac O'Keefe. This dude is an off-ball dynamo. The kid's like, you saw the Queen's Gambit. He's like that with lacrosse. The way that, what's her name, name is with chess, Mac O'Keefe is like that with on-field presence, spatial awareness on the field. I bet you Mac O'Keefe is wicked good at um, uh, social distancing during COVID. Have we? Has anyone said that? If Mac O'Keefe is as good as he is off ball, finding space, you know, finding passing lanes to camp in so people can hit him and he can score easy goals, imagine how good he is at social distancing. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about that. And I'm, and, and that's going to affect the MLL, the you know the number of guys that are taken in the MLL because you have easily, I'd say, ten guys that are no brainers coming out of this draft, and you don't have a whole lot of roster spots to fill. So you have the young guys coming in, and and how many of them are going to stick and end up on rosters by the end of it? You have the MLL guys coming in, and you only have one roster to fill. A couple of guys here and there that have retired. You probably have a couple of geezers that they could push 
out of the league? Is it time now for 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 the Donowskis and the Crotties and the Rabels of the world to give up their roster spots? I know they're not going to give up their roster spots. That's that's stupid. None of them are going to choose that. But at what point does do these some of the guys when the leagues were split, some of the older guys were able to kind of hang, you know, it, it Rabel Rabel compared to some, you know, once you bring in the young MLL guys that tore it up, especially at the mid and you're bringing in some of the college guys, I mean, do the older geezers in the league still um, belong? Are they going to still be able to perform at a level that justifies that spot, especially now that we only have eight teams? We go from what, seven plus six, you know, blah, blah, blah. we have like 12 to 14 teams. I don't remember what the exact number was. And now we drop down to eight. And a lot of those guys that didn't perform last year, if this was regular pro sports and politics and social media popularity didn't play into it at all, some of these old guys are out and uh, it stinks for them. But it's it, every it's like I said, it just got a, a hell of a lot harder uh, to play pro lacrosse. And you could look at it as a bad thing, but to me, it's nothing but a good thing. A couple of other goalies. Uh, we talked about Scanoni. Christian Knight had a really good season. Brian Phipps. Uh, I've always been a Nick Washuda fan, although when you kind of compare his stats to the other guys, you know, it doesn't necessarily hold up. So all things that we have to consider here now is uh, not necessarily what we have to consider, but what we have to kind of watch for from here is what are we how is the the draft going to work work how's the expansion draft going to work how are they going to tie that into other teams maybe be, being able to pull from that too and if that ends up being the case you may see a little bit more turnover on the rosters where it's like hey we've got these three dudes that were on the roster last year boom cut we don't need them anymore we're going to bring in one of the draft picks and two MLL guys or something like that and i i was listening to forget who which podcast i was listening to uh, last night or maybe it was early this morning where they were talking about um, how many guys, like what's the number? What is the number of MLL guys that are going to end up being able to make that move? Is the number 20? Is the number 10? Is the number 15? Like we've got a 20, you know, I don't know. I forget. They don't, the PLL teams, I think only hold what, 18 to 22 guys on their roster or 21 guys on their roster. So we have 21 roster spots available, maybe with some guys, some turnover and crap like that. You have maybe 28 to 30 roster spots to fill across all of these teams where if, and that's assuming they're willing to move some of the other guys and move away from some of the other guys, how will uh, that transpire? And guys, you know, as, as we look at the points leaders, at least, because that's an easy, um, an easy stat to look at for the MLL guys, um, points per game, Ryan Lee, like I said, RIT could, he, uh, he tore it up for Denver. He goes, uh, he leads in points per game, four points per game, five games played, 18 goals, two helpers. Then he had Bryce Wasserman that tore it up as well for uh, the Boston Cannons, 14 goals and five helpers. Uh, Lyle Thompson, obviously, 14 and five. Andrew Q came out of nowhere and tore it up. He goes 14 and five. Where's Q out of? I think Q's out of a D2 or D3 school, if I recall. Uh, Chris Aslanian, uh, seven and ten. Brad Voigt, sixteen and one. Connor O'Hara, fourteen and one. Brendan Sunday, big bodied attackman out of Towson, eleven and four. Bucaro, thirteen and two. And I think Bucaro's a no brainer. I think he fits all. He, he, yeah, he was ninth in points per game, but I think uh, star factor. Will Sands tore it up. He went four and eleven. Um, so that's that's huge. Will Sands led the league in assists. Randy Stotts had tennis. Uh, had uh, what did he have? 10 helpers, uh, Tommy Palasek, Galasso. So I think if, if you looked at that points per game, the guys leading in points per game, those are the guys I think that are the most likely to make that move offensively. Orion Lee, Bryce Wasserman, Lyle Thompson, Q probably. And I think Q because he was kind of a fan favorite. You get this dude who's overachieving in everybody's eyes, even though everyone who knew him knew that he could play ball. A Brad Voigt is somebody whose persona I dig, a nice fellow, but also he's got, you know, he's got a, you know, swag, and on the field, especially, the dude finishes like crazy. I know his first season where he got that wraparound, that was dirty. And then last season, he, he played really well. So the, the points per game crew, those guys, they're going to they're gonna do well. Daniel Ficaro touched the ball a lot, too. He led the, he was second in the league in, uh, in shots. And in terms of goals, he was seventh. So he was kind of a high-volume uh, kind of guy. Then as we look at the face-off guys, because that's, that's a big thing in the PLL, too. They need some guys to be able to compete. Um, at, at the faceoff dot because they are loaded. Every team has a, a very capable um, faceoff man. So you got Alex Widal. That was ground balls. Let's look at faceoff percentage. Adler, Adler, 
pretty much dominated at the faceoff X. He goes 64.8% at the faceoff X. And then Alex Woodall, he won the most faceoffs with 79 because he took the bulk of them for, for Philadelphia. And uh, he won 59% of them. So you'd almost say that like it, between Adler and Woodall, and then you have the Reisman, uh, Kevin Reisman out of Boston, he was 62 point, you know, so you got three faceoff guys out there at the top that could definitely help some people. And then in terms of the the defenders, uh, Warren Jeffrey, Warren Jeffrey is one mean motherfucker. And I like that about him. Kyle Pless, Ben Randall, you know, there's dudes that could play ball, man. And then, and those are just the guys that were able to get takeaways. That doesn't count some of the guys that I'm just not. I'm drawing blanks on and that didn't make the stat line simply because people avoided them like AIDS in the 1980s. So that's a thing as well. So man, it's nuts. It's nuts. It's all good. I think in the end, I think if you look at ev the evolution of the sport and trying to make sure that we're furthering the sport and pushing, pushing the envelope and continuing to progress, it's, it's all good. And it will be all good three, four or five years from now. If you have any level of compassion, you got to feel bad for all the people who just lost their jobs, both the staff and the players, the coaches, everybody that does stink. But I do, I do like that caveat that that stinks. But what this just did for the quality of play in the league that won out is going to be it, it, the trade off. You know, the trade off is probably it's better for the sport to have happen. Um, what happened? And I know a lot of people don't believe that. I know there's people, and, and I'm not saying your argument's not valid. I mean, if you were to say, hey, it was it was better for the sport to have one league that gave people something to go see every other weekend when they played home games and you had the community around that, and that way it was still being played at a very high level, and then you have the other league that was played at a slightly higher, albeit different level, that was the traveling circus, you know, in the Carney model, um, to have both of them in place was better for the sport than to have this happen. And I don't disagree maybe over the next year or even two years that maybe that would have been better for all of us as fans. But like they say, in terms of what's better long-term, this is it. This is better long-term. This is what was going to happen long-term. So now we get to pull the Band-Aid off. We get to see what happens and uh, we move on and let's let the chips fall where they may, friends. So that's it. I rambled a lot. I covered a lot. Let me just make sure I didn't miss anything else. Uh, as I said, question of the day for any of you guys that want to interact. Uh, what's your take on the PLL MLL merger? If you're from a now former MLL market, how bad will you miss it? And what was your fondest memory? Uh, you can also go to anchor.fm forward slash lax factor and you can send us an audio note. So if you wanted to come in and, and, and get on the air, uh, we'll play your audio message over the air. You know, any questions you have or comments that you just want to make, uh, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash lax factor and there'll be a, a, a link to send a message and that will actually pop up on your phone even a uh, little voice. Uh, recording and you can record your question and we'll get that that way or you can just tag us in social media we are uh, twitter is at lax factor facebook is uh, facebook.com forward slash lax factor uh, instagram we are at lax factor podcast and then youtube we are youtube.com forward slash lax factor and then as always too you can go to laxfactor.com you can uh, we have a feedback form at the bottom of the site you can send emails to us that way as well and get some swag man support the show buy a t-shirt. We have all sorts of other crap on the site as well, but the t-shirts with the logo are pretty dope. Uh, so you can help us out that way by doing that, but that's it. We will be back, uh, probably do another show here this weekend where we'll talk more about college stuff. We'll talk a little bit about the PLL or the inside lacrosse top 25 in terms of the men, or should I say top 24? Because I think I did confirm that they had in their top 50, that they mixed the girls and the guys together for some strange reason. You know, here they're all woke and everything should be fair, but let's put 26 girls in against uh, 24 guys in the top 50 list. So I thought that was super woke of them, uh, a little bit stupid. I get it. I get it. You're trying to be cool, but, you know, let's make it fair and let's, or let's not have a combined list at all and let's just have 25 guys and 25 girls. But probably if I'm playing devil's advocate to my own uh, bitter uh, um, opinion, I would end up saying that I think the benefit is that putting them together like that does bring a lot of uh, visibility to the girls game. There was a lot. I read the whole list and read through the girls even, and I didn't know any of these people. So it did add a little bit of visibility. And now I'm aware of a few other players and, and uh, their story that I wasn't before in the girl side of it. So, so if I'm not being a grumpy old man, I would say that there was, there is benefit to it, but it's still a little weird that we only had 24 guys. So, all right, that's it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I will be back again this weekend and then uh, back next week, uh, Thursday morning again. So Hoost is out.